Hi, I'm Heather Knockwood. I'm from Indian Brook First Nation. I'm going to talk about the MHRRA, Micmac Heritage Research and Restoration Association, and the work that I do personally. I got asked to step in as a teacher for children. Now, while I don't have um, a formal education in Mi'kmaq language because it's non-existent, like the university has only accepted it this um, in 2018, so it's not like you can go to school for this. This stuff here is like what you know. So, um, but uh, what had happened was I was just asked to step in as a substitute teacher, and I was thinking, well, what I like to teach the kids is because I get hired um, occasionally to work at the daycare. And what I noticed is the children knew more about Mi'kmaq than I did. They knew their animals, they knew their numbers, um, they knew most of their colors. And so I said, well, if I'm to go in there, and I, I think I had only three hours scheduled before the, the real teachers came and they couldn't come in on a Friday night. And what had happened was I said, well, I would like to teach the children conversation. If we can teach them conversation, because you could ask them any question and they knew the answer. And, but they weren't um, talking to one another. So that's what I found was lacking in it, the education. So, so they said, sure, you can do that, that'd be fine. So I made a skit with them and then I made a puppet. And um, that was my first introduction to it, except the puppet was too heavy. So I further designed it with a couple more puppets to work with the children and they loved it. They, they loved me more than the other teacher because they weren't looking for um, the, the modern classroom type environment that they were so used to. And if it, if it became too much like school, then what had happened was they were um, not wanting to go. But if you can make it fun, and, and we took a lot of breaks, um, and then the learning to me was everything, because they were a little on the hyper side, so they knew there was a playground outside. So, okay, well, let's go to the playground. And then I said, well, what color is this? And black is Mukdaweg, and white is Wabeg. So we started using nature as the guide to learn, and, and they seemed to be responding really well on that. And one of the colors was really difficult. And we had a couple of the um, students who were more advanced than the others. So they taught the ones that weren't so far advanced. And like I said, so I was quite happy to be part of that uh, back in August. And uh, they actually um, kept me, they kept me on to um, just fill in if somebody uh, couldn't make it. So, and so largely I work with children and I use um, puppets so that the puppets only speak Mi'kmaq language and I'll speak English to them, but they have to speak Mi'kmaq to the puppet. And I thought it was a kind of a, a nice way for a child if they're alone and they got dolls to to converse with uh, their toys in Mi'kmaq language. The one of the change that, I, that I've seen is when I've introduced conversation to them, like to say hello, Gwe, uh, Medellin, it's how are you? And um, Willie said boo, it's like good morning. They, they were saying that the parents were coming back and they were thanking me. They were saying, you know what? My daughter learned more in your three-hour education than some of the other programs. So I think, wow, and and I don't pretend that I'm a school teacher or anything like that. I just go wherever I'm needed. And uh, my mother was uh, fluent in Mi'kmaq language, and I grew up speaking other languages than my own language, and, and it was purposely kept from us. And I think the reason for that is because the residential school affects. My um, parents didn't go to residential school but they believed, and they honestly did believe that they were doing the right thing for us. So, so my speaking is a little bit delayed, and sometimes I, I have to think more about it. It doesn't come naturally. So, so when a parent comes up to me and says, they really liked what you were teaching, Heather, and it's like, really? And she says, and they're actually repeating what you're saying. So, so if you can find an alternative to learning, because I believe uh, First Nation people are visual learners, um, that the, the fact that they're repeating me at home, um, to me, it's what I'm seeing, and it just makes my day. Well, when it comes to the Mi'kmaq language, um, what, what we have is we have a whole movement from the, um, the recommendations from the residential school. And so part of it is to give us back our language. So we see an influx of all these great, wonderful programs. So, so I'm just happy that for my age that I live to see this because I grew up learning how to speak French, learning how to speak Spanish, um, thinking and considering Mandarin, Chinese, for languages that should travel around the world because we already know English. So the Mi'kmaq language was something I never thought I would ever live to see the day where the government is putting money into our language and our language is making a comeback because they're bringing it into the schools. Um, and so what I see is the children who know the colors where I didn't know the colors. I only knew uh, black and white, like I didn't know, um, I, I know a lot more colors now, 
uh, and I use word association with children. So, so what I'm seeing is the children know and they're pronouncing it properly. And this is when I fill in for like, um, I fill in at the bus monitor and I fill in at the daycare. And when I see a, a three and a four year old having better pronunciation than me, it's just like, wow, I just sit there and I'm in awe and they're singing songs. And it's like, um, I, I sing a little bit of songs and I, I am in a choir. So when I hear them singing songs, uh, you know, the wheels on the bus go round and round. And uh, so it's, it's quite interesting from what I see now from what I had growing up. We, we've never had the opportunity to learn our language. So, so that the government is taking this serious and it's working. So I'm saying we will get our language back. And even though I'm not fluent, every year I said, well, maybe this is going to be my year. Or this is going to be my year. Because I do have Mi'kmaq speaking friends that I plan on uh, practicing more with because it's in there. So if I was raised with it here in an everyday of my life, it, there's a block because we were told not to do it. And so now that we're allowed to speak it, it's just something that just warms your heart and you're, you're happy to see. And I'm really proud that the children seem like they know more than me. Like they're more apt about being quizzed about it because with their mind, they, with the age of reason from, what is it, from 8 to 12 or is it from 5 to 12, they won't have to think about the translation of the word. And, and that's how I am with uh, French because I started learning it when I was 12. I can actually think in two languages now so I understand um, the languages and, and trying to get it out there. And for me, uh, where I heard it every day, like I'm still... Um, trying to sort that out in my brain because it's there. So I'm thinking that with a whole lot more practice that that little delay when you're you're translating it to a, one language to another will no longer exist. So, but um, anyway, so I'm just seeing that there's um, quite the influx of our learning our language, especially for the children. Um, there's a few adult learning courses and I believe they need more. And the bottom line with all of this is commitment. Um, when I first started doing this, even before I was asked to teach, um, we did a six month course and it was one day a week and it was very extensive. And, um, I told my sister, I said, you know, we grew up with this every single day. We need to go to every class and we need not to miss any classes because we heard it every day. And I said, we will be fluent. So, and, um, she's a little bit more advanced than me because, uh, she had a coworker in the class that was participating with her and their boss was fluent. So they would go to work every day and they would practice. So, so she, here I am, we're here. And now she's like there. So I know that it is possible. So, and like I said, it's just practice, practice, practice. And there's a lot more out there than there used to be. There's a lot on YouTube, I find too, as well. Indigenous education for me is the art of learning through visual cues or word association. Um, because one thing I, I found out um, in the year 2000 that I think it's about 80% of First Nation, no, 33% of First Nation people are visual learners. So what does that mean? First Nation children learn differently. And I guess I didn't es escape the 33% because I struggled in university and I didn't know why. So with an educational assessment done, and I had it done at, um, in Ontario, University of Western Ontario, and I thought, I'm just going to give it what I got to see, like, it, what is this block that's happening? And they said, well, 33% um, of First Nation people, because of our oral traditions on how we learn, it's just kind of like a, a residual gene that our learning will become something visual. So, so that's why, for me, when I'm teaching the children, I use puppets, and they make it something visual, and they make it something fun, and they're more apt to retain it. And so, uh, so like I said, this is how we learn. So for Indigenous education, to me, it's, it's from the, uh, the elders, our grandparents, our parents, our aunt and uncle, to, to come in and teach us. And now that uh, my parents are no longer with us, my grandparents are no longer with us, we're the, new, um, we're the next generation that has to um, delay this to our, um, relay this to our children. So this to me is what Indigenous education is. It's just sharing off our, our customs, our traditions, our knowledges, and our crafts, whatever we want to put it, is we need to pass it on to the children. So because I, where I came from, um, my parents and my grandparents uh, made crafts for a living and they sold them door to door. Um, in Halifax, I mean, my father had to walk to work. Uh, right now, we're on a centralized community, and there's really no easy way out here. So um, they would have to 
make extra money over and above what they had to do just to get a car. I mean, my father would have to hitchhike to work. And so they made baskets and they sold them door to door. And my, uh, my mother was so mad because it was Easter time. And my father made $200 and he bought a truck. So we didn't have to hitchhike anymore, and she wanted that money for Easter. So, but um, that's how I ever. That's how I grew up. You need more money, make more money. You know, do a job, do an odd job. And uh, my mother uh, made baskets. Uh, she made flowers. I was taught uh, birch bark roses by my aunt Amy Ronnie. Um, and so my grandfather would have a multitude of stuff. He would make totem poles, um, and and he intrigued my uh, imagination the same as my mother. So. I found that if you don't hinder a child's creativity, they're more apt to learn, they're more apt to know what they want, and they're more apt to uh, not second guess themselves. So, so if you don't take away the creativity from a child, you would do that. Um, so when, when I think about my life, I was filled with people who were making, um, who were entrepreneurs. My mother made the famous Gino sub. Um, my aunt Genevieve, my, um, my grandfather's only sister, she was a famous leather work. Um, and she, I, I one time bought this little kit, uh, moccasin kit, and my father saw that I loved to create as a child, and that's why I like making puppets for children, because it's just part of my creativity. So when it came to that, um, my, my aunt gave me all of her patterns, and I actually um, made crafts and had a business when I was 12 years old. And the crafts, um, I made moccasins, and, and I only had that one year because it was a lot of hard work for the money I made. Uh, we sold them down in Yarmouth, and my father was kind of like my agent. I got picked up, um, I got commissioned for a princess pageant to make the moccasins for that at the age of 12. So right now, um, I'm not doing a whole lot of uh, creating. I'm not as creative as Roseanne because uh, my hands have, have worn out, and I'm, I'm waiting for surgery on my uh, hands. I got some minor repairs to be done, but... To me, like, to be around by um, everybody being so creative in my life, um, like uh, my mom's older sister, um, Aunt Rita and Uncle Way, they made baskets. My mother knew how to make baskets. And usually um, it's a husband and wife team because um, the woman will, will weave it and then the husband will do the heavy work around the top and, and, and help secure where it's a little bit harder to wrap. So I've had all of these beautiful uh, people show me their creativity and selling this stuff and and making a living out of it. And like I said, my grandfather, my father's side, he would always use what you got. Uh, he would take those giant mushrooms and, and, and hammer that on a board and make like a nativity scene for, for Christmas. And uh, my only regret is that we didn't press, um, we didn't make that our most prized possession to save those things. And he'd make walking sticks. And so my father was always coming home with uh, his creativity, um, the stuff he created. And, and he did have a store too, by the way. And so when I think about all the stuff I did, I just took pride in what I created and, and passed on what I could. Because really, back in the day, nobody was listening. But if you had a true love for the creativity and knew that that would feed your family, well, then you just go on and do it. So, um, but like I said, I had a multitude of um, role models um, who would make a living out of that. And to me, that the art of making something and going out and having our native craft and to sell it as long as it's not a sacred item um and i and i don't make any sacred items but um th they would make a good living out of selling baskets and flowers and stuff like that and, and even in this case food the biggest impact is that uh, my mother she passed away and she was fluent and when i thought now why didn't i learn when she was alive like that still bewilders me that I choose to speak other languages. So, so when I signed up for the course, it's more like it was in her honor, like because I really felt that um, with the way the education was going, and until we had the the movement in language that you see today, this was a dying language, which I I felt. And when I started going to these conferences, I said, you know what, we're only a generation away from losing our language. If I can have a fluent mother and speak English and, and not be fluent in Mi'kmaq language, then we got a real problem here. And, and um, I'm kind of glad that the residential school recommendations came out because then we're, we're starting to see changes and it's in the language with the children and the adults who are saying they're speaking up now to say, hey, I know I, I, I'm fluent too. Like, there's more people coming forward that they're fluent. Like my sister, Sean, I had no idea she was fluent uh, because uh, when my mother got sick, she stopped speaking English. And for a while, she would only respond in Mi'kmaq. 
And I'm like, I know you can speak English, but she, with her mind where she, um, she had a congestive heart failure. And so it kind of reverted her memory back. And so my sister started speaking to her in Mi'kmaq, and I'm like, wow, because you see, she was around, my grandparents were around. So she got to have that knowledge, but up until that time, which was about five years ago, I didn't even know she was fluent. So, so when I'm hearing people in our community who are maybe about 10 years older than me, maybe even 15, to, to know that they speak it. And so there's like a, this revitalization because they're coming back. Um, and the only thing that I'm seeing that's different from them who speak it, because we're seeing a large influx of fluent speakers come into these courses that MHRRA is putting on. And I'm thinking, wow, there's like, out of um, 50, there was 20 of them that were fluent, maybe even more, like 25. And I'm like, and I, I didn't think I would see this day. And I was like, why are they coming to the classes? Because they need the components. They're, they're learning with the Smith Francis orthography, so they're learning to read and write in the language. And a lot of people who teach it, it takes them that one step further that they didn't know that where they were they're at because they were teaching it to people, but they were missing that component. So um, the Nova Scotia Chiefs made it um, a motion that we follow Smith Francis. So, so there are still books that are being sold in the old formats. And the, I'll tell you one thing about the old formats. Before Smith Francis came out, you couldn't catch on to them. And uh, because I tried. Where I sing in a choir, somebody had phonetically written it out. And to write the, the Mi'kmaq language out phonetically, it's, it's really long. <laughs> Right. And uh, it, it's you got to teach people. So when I, when I go to these classes, because they they started inviting me to other classes just in case they needed me to step forward in case somebody got sick or whatever. I'm like the, the back person. Right. And so it's the most important thing you got to do is when you read these languages, you have to kind of forget what you learned up to this point And you've got to start recognizing the letters like uh, the K as a G, a T as a D. So. So I said, you got to start thinking in this way. And if you can think this way, you won't have to write it up phonetically. You can start learning to read it. And um, uh, the biggest thing that I guess that I'm an advocate on is that um, I got voluntold to help out in a video, right? And that's the one I'm going to be sharing uh, on the Mi'kmaq al alphabet is because we went to three levels of children and they weren't singing the Mi'kmaq alphabet. They were singing the Canadian alphabet. And so they, they were teaching the alphabet at a higher age. But what I learned back in 2000, um, I, I did study um, to be a linguist at one point. Um, we got that age of reason. So we need to bring that age of reason in for the children to get them to know the alphabet at an earlier age, the Mi'kmaq alphabet. And um, when I go to these um, settings at the daycare and at the school, they have all the posters down for the colors and and their clothing, and um, they, they're not getting into the part of speech. They're like learning one word at a time. So I'm thinking, we got to make the Mi'kmaq alphabet a priority because it's not a priority. And the children there, they're like sponges. Like they know all these words. And like I said, for them to get the alphabet at a younger age, like I know that anybody's entering, you can ask any three-year-old, they know the Canadian alphabet. So we need to go back to that. And that's the same thing as I tell an adult. You need to know the alphabet. You need to know the sounds because once you know the sounds in the alphabet, then, then you could read it and then you practice on reading that. And if you have to spell it phonetically to start, that's fine. But you have to train yourself to read it for, for what it is. So that's the biggest thing that I think is missing in this whole component because the children are there. They're doing a fantastic job. I'm thinking we just need to tweak it more and, and, and move it up that one more inch of, from what I'm seeing because... Like I said, getting back to it, I never thought I'd be here telling you what I see, what I've seen in my life, and, I, and I'm liking what I'm seeing. I'm liking that all the changes are made. And I'm thinking, could we be better? A little bit, because um, I guess the next thing I would love to see is when I get um, called into these um, settings that the children start talking to one another, right? And, or that I'm talking with my friends, I'm talking with my family. And, and we do have some of it, but it's, it's, it's such a broken language with us. Um, like, for instance, when I was um, 20 years old, I didn't know what was Mi'kmaq and, and what was English. So I had that kind of confusion as an adult. And then I thought, and then here, um, we, we developed our own slang in our own community. 
And so what we're trying to do now is break the slang so that we have a word. Let's, let's try to train you what the proper word is. Let's get away from the slang. So, so those things I'm seeing that are being, I guess, rectified. And so anyway, I'm just so happy to be here to see that these things are happening in our community and outside our community. In the next 10 years, we, we need to continue doing what we're doing. Um, and I believe that um, uh, Mi'kmaq um, education, Mi'kmaq education, they call it, um, I can't even say the long word, but it's MK. Um, Mi'kmaq Kinemosity, I think. I think I'm, I'm mispronouncing the name. Um, they're making the um, criteria for the language. And I think in that, I think that's going to be released this year. And maybe someone else can talk more about that. But once this criteria gets released, um, and, the, and, and so I'm thinking what's going to happen is we're going to create the new standards. Not me. I'm not on the committees to create it. But once the standard is complete and it's out there, I think we're going to really see this escalate and change. And so I'm saying in the next 10 years, we need to keep going where we're going. And actually, we need to step it up a notch higher than we're doing right now. Uh, there still needs to be a continued influx because the children are learning. But in the same time, we also need to um, learn the adults so that the child has somebody to communicate with. So we need to see more adult learning in, in towards all of the curriculums because we need somebody to talk to, right? And we need to have more, um, over the next 10 years, the fluent speaking communities, uh, we need to see more of this um, exchange, I guess, with uh, speaking and non-speaking. Because one thing I did learn about the language, it takes two years of... Um, uh, immersion to learn a language. So I like to see some more immersion type programs or the next best thing. So um, maybe video conferences because uh, most of the speakers now are in Unamagi, which is a Cape Breton communities. And uh, they're, that's about what, five hour drive away. So I like to see more of this interaction with our Mi'kmaq speaking communities with the non-speaking communities because our community um, here was the first to lose our language. Then I seen the next was Millbrook. And, and then uh, a while back, I started seeing it um, happening in the Mi'kmaq speaking communities. And uh, I was like, um, no, no, please don't, you know, please teach your child. So I've been an advocate to people to please teach your child um, your language, which is our language. But um, I teach to other people too, who not not necessarily Mi'kmaq saying, please let them learn their language. Because yeah, a lot of people think it's a disadvantage and it's not a disadvantage. So, so like I said, this is where I want to see it. I still like to see the programs continue to the point that we are speaking it until we do have the language back so that we are on our own to teach our own children. In this case, it would be for me, for like my grandchildren or my great-grandchildren, that they're going to be speaking our language so that it's not a lost language, which is what I originally thought growing up, that um, why should I learn it? I will have nobody speak with it, speak um, um, to with it and in reality there's a lot of people for me to speak with and so uh, it's one of the to me the greatest failures that was imposed upon us was to lose our language well here if you if you live near a Mi'kmaq community the programs offer serve are existent but here we live in a community where we have our own school um, no because when we when, when there's courses offered here we have people offer serve coming in to our program, so to me, the th the issue isn't on and off reserve. The issue is commitment. It takes a commitment to learn a language. You got to show up. You got to want it. Cause I see a few people who say they want to learn it, but what are they doing? And it's like, oh, I miss that class. Oh, I'll come next week. And I'm thinking, this is our last class after six months. Like you can procrastinate it away, which is like um, our class was about um, like ten people. And so people showed up at different intervals, but they didn't have the commitment to stay there. So six months might be too long. So right now we might want to have little smaller, more manageable courses um, to fit people's busy lifestyle. Um, so that's what I'm thinking. I think the biggest thing in here is not on off service commitment because um, I got a couple thousand friends on Facebook. So when I try to share anything that's going on out there, and there's a lot of programs here on the community, but they, they welcome anybody. It doesn't necessarily mean you're on and off. It just really got to get here at your own expense type deal. And if you really want to do something, you will travel at your own expense.